Vince, thank you so much for joining me in this show. And the zero trust journey is simply shrinking those down with authentication throughout that process. But your inventory is very important for that reason. Yes. Definitely get the uh, the stakeholders very mm -hmm. familiar with the NIST 800-207 documentation. Oh. Mm -hmm. Identity feeds the zero trust architecture. And all MFA is not created equal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, multi it's not infallible, but it's better than the others. Mm -hmm. And then figure out that, well, I meet, I met the compliance, but in reality, you haven't met the security requirements. If you're not using any MFA, please use some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the first step. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into our Scale to Zero show. I'm Purshottam, co-founder and CTO of CloudEnc. Scale to Zero is a forum where we collect questions from curious security professionals, and we invite security experts to learn about their journey and get these security questions answered. Our goal is to build a community where we learn about security together and leave no security questions unanswered. With that, let's get started. So for today's episode, we have uh, Vince Romney. Vince is the head of global security architecture at New Skin Enterprise, where he leads the design and implementation of information security program. Prior to that, he was the director of information security at the Unique Product. Vince, thank you so much for joining me in this show. Thank you for having me, Peru. So uh, we uh, have a two section format. The first section focuses on security questions and the second one is around rapid fire. So let's start with a uh, security question. So in that, I want to start with zero trust, right? It's quickly becoming like a new normal in the cyber security. When it comes to zero trust, there are many pillars like identity, devices, network, applications, and workloads. And there are many principles as well for the implementation, like continuous verification, limiting blast radius, automation of IT stack, et cetera, et cetera. So what should be the starting point for a zero trust uh, security setup? And how should it be prioritized across all of these areas? So I think one of the core principles behind zero trust is the original terminology that was applied to it, which is deperimeterization. And uh, when, a, when an entity looks at taking the journey towards zero trust, one of the first things they have to do is really evaluate and drew, uh, uh, draw down the first CIS benchmarks, one and two, which okay. is the inventory. Mm -hmm. uh, without that inventory and an accurate assessment of what that inventory implies, you're not going to be able to look at zero trust uh, in a in a reality base. You're going to be saying, oh, I want to apply a little bit of zero trust in certain places. Mm -hmm. Once you have an architecture understood, you have your inventory, you know what your infrastructure looks like, what your application uh, environment looks like, then you can start that journey towards zero trust by looking at where you currently have uh, applied perimeters. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, those trust perimeters that bring into an implicit trust zone are generally very wide. Mm -hmm. And the zero trust journey is simply shrinking those down with authentication throughout that process. So I think CIS benchmark one and two uh, mm -hmm. are your best starts uh, because that, now you have somewhere to, to lay the groundwork and understand what your baseline is. Okay. So understanding the inventory and CIS benchmark one and two are the key uh, starting point. Sure. Okay. That that's lovely. So with that information, uh, most of the times, you know, even though you have all the information, implementation is easier uh, um, said than done, right? So for organizations Certainly. implementing zero trust, there can be many challenges like additional cost impact or complexity of the setup or maintenance of the overall security setup as well, right? So for a cost uh, sensitive organization, let's say mid-size organization, how should they approach tackling these challenges? Well, I think uh, any organization is cost sensitive, especially in today's world, regardless of size. But uh, it, that inventory Going back to that allows you to understand what assets you currently have. So let's say you're an Office 365 group. Well, mm -hmm. are you actually leveraging all of the things within Office 365 that apply to zero trust? So you have identity providers, you know, so you've got your Azure uh, Active Directory or Active Directory on-prem. Mm -hmm. uh, is that being leveraged appropriately to provide authentication uh, 
or identity for authentication throughout the ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of tooling within your just Office 365 toolkit that can allow you to tighten things up and reduce the amount of uh, uh, broad perimeter that's applied in your organization. So I hate to fall back to that same comment, but your inventory is very important for that reason. As a cost sensitive company, the other thing I would say is definitely get the, uh, the stakeholders that will be making decisions very mm -hmm. familiar with the NIST 800-207 documentation. That documentation is the basis for uh, you know, NIST uh, uh, thoughts and approach on zero trust. It's the foundational document for zero trust. So become very familiar with that document and how it applies. And as you look at vendors, mm -hmm. uh, because honestly, every vendor says they're zero trust now, uh, look at that vendor through the eyes of 800-207 and look at your diagrams in there and understand where that vendor fits because that vendor may be claiming that they are zero trust. Mm -hmm. You want that journey for zero trust. Make sure you understand where they fit and what function they hold within that. Okay. Uh, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like having understanding of the inventory, understanding the architecture and sort of mapping them to the NEST framework to see whether whatever the vendors are saying, whether they are accurate to the zero trust or philosophy or not, right? right. And you, you touched on one of the core components of uh, zero trust, right? The identity. And mm -hmm. identity, not just for zero trust, even for um, information security, it sort of holds all the aspects of the organization together, right? So we received a question from a security leader in the healthcare uh, setup, uh, like organizations, uh, like, how should they protect access to the data uh, securely to their employees, especially in today's world where remote is becoming normal, right? So in that sure. type of a setup, how should they protect access to the data? Uh, and uh, uh, also, how should they ensure that the data is protected at the same time? So I think the uh, falling into, say, the NIST 800-207 model, Mm -hmm. Identity feeds the zero trust architecture. So mm -hmm. it in, in and of itself is not zero trust architecture. It is a, a feeder or a provider to the policy decision point, uh, policy enforcement point, that model. So you've got a, uh, an, a policy engine that mm -hmm. would drive the policy. You have a policy administrator. Those become the policy decision point. And then you have the policy enforcement point. And uh, that's in the control plane. So. Mm -hmm. A, a an entity looking to use identity as a key part of that first off needs to determine that they're using the principles applied to identity first. Mm -hmm. Is it truly a least privilege model? Now, least privilege is a, a you know commonly used term and understood across the industry. Okay. But if you look at what uh, what zero trust is, it's the implementation of least privilege throughout an ecosystem. So if we if we take identity and this healthcare provider is looking at it, I have an identity provider. Now, how have you broken down that those identity into functional roles so that you can break those roles down and, and enforce those roles with a policy? And I, I, you know, backing up to that, I did. Do you even have the capacity at the control plane to enforce that? If you don't, mm -hmm. that's one of the first sets of tooling you need to go investigate is look at how you would enforce your policies uh, that apply to those roles that are fed by the identity. Makes sense. So defining the policies and then enforcing the policies of least privilege across your tech stack, right? Across your architecture. Um, right. So I, I want to ex like continue on the identities a little bit. Like when it comes to identities, MFA is one of the critical components, uh, right? And uh, there are many ways to set up uh, MFA. Like yeah, there can be app based, uh, hardware device based, biometric. Like there are many channels coming up, right? So there are and there are pros and cons to all of these. So what is your recommendation to organizations who are trying to set it up properly, and how should they ensure that they are following the best practices of uh, these privileges? So uh, you hit on a very important point to understand: all MFA is not created equal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, multi-factor authentication is uh, widely applied in a various, you know, various models. So you've got mm -hmm. the, the original was just an SMS text, right? And then we found out that that was pretty easily circumvented. And Thanks. so then it moved to, you know, say just your email. Well, again, 
compromise email, it's now circumventable. And now we have applications on phones, which take it to another level. You have a client-based application that's feeding that. That's better than the others. It's not infallible, but it's better than the others. Then you get to hardware tokens, which are much more difficult to circumvent, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then it breaks down into what factors are we dealing with? And in the modern world, most of what we're dealing with is something you have and something you know. Uh, the biometric is still not fully implemented in that model. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are cases where my phone is something I have, and hence I have a client device on that phone, and Microsoft Authenticator is on my phone. I have something I know, which was the password I used to make the initial authentication. That, that sends the uh, notice to Authenticator. Authenticator gives me the code, and I can type that in, or I can use my biometric on Authenticator to thumbprint it and then authenticate it back in. So I have flexibility in that case. That still boils down somewhat to something I have, right? It's still mm -hmm. that phone. Um, uh, but it's now I'm applying a biometric factor to the thing I have. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of models out there. First and foremost, if you're not using any MFA, please use some. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the first step. And even if you were to just use SMS, which I don't recommend, it's better than not using it. But the confidence you place on that has to be subjected to the caveat that it's circumventable and, right, and right. relatively trivially done. Mm -hmm. So you know, just going all the way to the hardware token, that's great. You'll mm -hmm. see major entities that have implemented hardware tokens as a product uh, mm -hmm. that everyone in their organization uses. And mm -hmm. they have very little problem with credential identity attacks because right. they've done that. So, right. so yeah, uh, the, those are very valid points, right? In today's world, you cannot, you should not have a non MFA setup. MFA is like a must. Okay. And the second thing is the closer you get to the hardware based MFA, the better, right? In a way, SMS, email, right. they like, there are ways hackers are able to sort of bypass yeah. those, right? So the closer you get to hardware, the better it is. Um, so I want to sort of uh, move to a sec uh, another key component of zero trust, right? Uh, similar to identities, data is also another important uh, aspect, right? And if that is an important aspect for regular, like in general information security as well. So keeping the healthcare vertical in mind, what step, uh, steps would you recommend to store, protect, and provide access to sensitive data like PII or healthcare records or financial information? Well, there's, there's the foundational piece of, of, again, going back to zero trust, which is what is that data required to do? And mm -hmm. can you limit the access to that data down to that very specific requirement? Um, I, I don't think that there are many entities that really have implemented that level of control around their data. And looking at the, the structure of 80207, you can mm -hmm. see that there are, there is a, uh, a reference architecture there for taking the perimeterization down to that level where access to a specific, say, patient record is limited to a very a specific set of use cases. And any use case outside of that is disallowed. And then the roles that are assigned to those use cases then grab an identity, that a, a role is assumed by that identity, and then that can happen uh, for access to that data. Right. Uh, the other part, and you bring up healthcare, obviously, is making sure that you are doing this in a way where all of the controls that are applied are effectively logged and demonstrable because you're under a HIPAA environment. Right. And with that, you know, with that regulatory compliance element to it, you also have to be able to demonstrate compliance. Um, I, I am one that thinks that if you have a compliance framework, you have to meet that first approach your security first. Mm -hmm. Then look at how you're going to demonstrate that security to match the uh, compliance. A lot of people get inverted on that and go to the compliance first mm -hmm. and then figure out that, well, I meet, I met the compliance, but in reality, you haven't met the security requirement. Right. So security first, compliance later on. Yeah. yeah. And oh. so again, getting that, that data use down to a point where you understand what the use case is for that data and then build the policies around that that can be enforced to the roles that are assumed by an identity. Right, right. So it all comes back to 
uh, like your identity setup, the policy, defining the policies and sort of enforcing the policy for the zero trust. Right. Ma- makes a lot of sense. So, and again, that, that idea that the identity and the use case still have to match up. Mm-hmm. You know, if I, if I compromise your identity on the perimeter, but then I start moving through a zero trust ecosystem to get to a specific set of data and my use cases, how I'm approaching that don't follow policy, I can mm-hmm. be blocked in that process. Right. So even though I'm a nefarious actor that has compromised an identity, I can't actually get to the data I wanted because I've perimeterized that and reauthenticated both from an identity perspective, but also from a role and use case perspective. Right, right. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Here are the top three things I learned today. First, for Zero Trust, CIS 1 and 2 benchmarks are the most important. To start, draw and then understand your current inventory architecture. Second one, identity is one of the core components of Zero Trust and it feeds into Zero Trust policies. So define the policies and enforce the policies to incorporate Zero Trust throughout your infrastructure. The third one is MFA is a must in today's world. Uh, Hardware devices uh, like YubiKey are the best options. So now let's move on to the rapid fire section. So the first question is, what's your persona animal? Uh, I I don't have a single, but any animal that spends a lot of time in the mountains is my my spirit animal. Um, You know, and whether it's a predator or prey, they both have value. So uh, I'll, you know, I'll say elk and cougar. (laughs) I love that. I love that. Mountains. (laughs) So what's the biggest lie you have heard in cybersecurity? I'm too small to be of interest to an, uh, an attacker. Makes sense. I, I, whenever I hear that from a company, I'm like, you're wrong, but okay, you know, that's your perspective. But you're, nobody is too small to be of interest to someone who can get some money out of you. If you mm-hmm. have a job, if you have an income of any kind, and you have a computer, you're a target. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be hit. It just means you're a target. And you're mm-hmm. playing a roulette game wondering if you're going to get hit. Right, right. Sometimes startups don't take security seriously, thinking that, hey, we are too small for anybody to attack us. But yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, What advice would you give to your 25-year-old self uh, starting in security and why? Well, my 25-year-old self wasn't in security. uh, So that's always an interesting thing. Uh, I was at 25, I was in flight school in the Air Force. So there, you know, different career path, uh, but I ended up in security because I ended up in IT and in IT, in the Air Force, you know, information systems, information operations was where I landed and uh, they stood up cyber warfare back in 2005. Now I had always been very centric on security. All of the roles I played were very security centric. So it made sense that when we stood up cybersecurity warfare, that we fell into that. Lovely. Vince, thank you so much for the insightful discussion. I personally learned a lot from today's episode around Zero Trust. And I want to assure our viewers that this is not the end. We'll be back for a part two with Vince. So make sure you don't miss it. See you in the next episode. Thank you.